Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, welcome to Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. Today I'm going to be talking about EEG, or electroencephalography, which is one of the earliest methods in cognitive neuroscience that was discovered in the 1920s. In EEG, you put electrodes onto a person's scalp and you monitor the brain waves, the electrical activity that is emitted uh, from within their head. So remember that with EEG, we're just recording what is going on in the brain. We're not actually stimulating with electricity the brain at all. So whenever you're thinking or doing anything or even at rest, your brain is always electrically active and giving off small currents. And we can start to detect this by uh, using EEG. If you just hook somebody up to EEG equipment, one of the things that you will notice is this kind of wave-like structure of up and down um, lines. What we're seeing here is millisecond by millisecond changes in brain activity. So already this is very fast compared to, for instance, fMRI that takes many seconds for the bold response to reach a peak. So we're imaging brain activity in real time with EEG. On the y-axis, what we see is the electrical potential in, measured in microvolts that goes up and down between positive and negative. The positive and negative don't really mean anything itself. It just depends on what's active in the brain uh, and where the particular source of uh, electricity is at any particular point in time. But the wave-like structure has been interpreted in the past in terms of, for instance, whether a person is awake or asleep. We can measure the different sleep cycles with it. But we can't really tell much cognitively by just looking at somebody's EEG signal. One reason for this is that the electrical activity is coming from neurons all throughout the brain, widely distributed. So it's very hard to pinpoint uh, electrical activity that's due to, for instance, uh, listening to mind words now, or viewing faces, or uh, moving your hand and so on, because um, the, the electrical activity to do those particular tasks is swamped by the background electrical noise. So we say that EEG has quite a low signal to noise resolution, because uh, of the amount of background electrical activity that is in the brain. So how is it that neurons generate electrical activity? Well, we can think of two sources of electrical activity uh, in neurons that are uh, linked to, on the one hand, axons, which carry electrical activity out of the neuron, and dendrites, which are at the receiving end uh, of uh, electrical activity. So axons carry action poten potentials uh, towards other neurons. Although certain methods are sensitive to these action potentials, for instance invasive electrical recordings, the human EEG signal is ma based mainly on dendritic currents. So what happens is, is that uh, at the synapse uh, neurotransmitters are released, and neurotransmitters bind to certain receptors that change the flow of ions into the neuron, so electrically charged ions. This sets up um, what's called a dipole, so a set of um, negatively charged and positively charged uh, um, sources, uh, in, in effect, within the, the neuron. And we could think of this almost as like a flow of electrical uh, current be between these two different uh, ends. And this is happening on individual neurons as they uh, receive uh, chemical information via neurotransmitters. But this is not something that we would be able to detect at the scalp unless there were millions of neurons firing together and unless all these dipoles were aligned, so unless all the negatives and positives were pointing in the same direction. But this is what would happen, particularly in the cortex, where neurons are arranged uh, in a, an aligned fashion within the cortical sheet. Other regions of the brain might have neurons that are arranged not in the sheet-like fashion, and um, therefore we would be insensitive to picking up 
the electrical signals from these particular areas. So regions such as the thalamus might be invisible for EEG because the neurons are not aligned in this particular way. So the electrical activity of neurons um, reflects, in effect, their responsiveness to particular ongoing cognitions. So neurons that um, are responsive to sounds will generate uh, more electrical activity when uh, the person is being played sounds. Uh, regions in the visual cortex will respond when these neurons are presented with visual stimuli that these neurons are tuned into. And we could think of this as being what's called uh, rate coding. So the more uh, a neuron um, processes that information, the higher the rate of electrical activity within that neuron. Uh, and here we're measuring it mainly from the dendrites. What also happens across neurons is that neurons tend to synchronize their firing. So neurons that are processing the same object will fire uh, not only at a high rate, but will fire in synchronicity with each other. They will fire in particular rhythmic bursts. And this is one of the things that gives rise to this particular wave-like structure, is this rhythmic firing of neurons that happens uh, both when we're cognitively engaged and also at rest. So when um, a, a collection of neurons, for instance, in the cortical sheet are all active, we set up what's called a dipole of negative and positive sources. And these negative and positive sources will uh, conduct to the scalp and be what we detect when we place electrodes on our head. And whether or not it's negative or positive simply reflects the orientation of that dipole in the brain, so how it is positioned within the, uh, the, the cortical sheet or in other structures of the brain that uh, can give rise to EEG signals. One of the main ways in which EEG is used in cognitive neuroscience research is what's called event-related potentials, or ERPs. An event, in this case, might correspond to presenting a stimulus on the computer screen that the person then has to process in some way, or it might involve, for instance, pressing a button. But the point about an event is that it occurs at a particular point in time that is known and that you can use in order to analyse the EEG signal. In effect, what we're trying to do in event-related potentials is we're trying to isolate the electrical activity that is involved in that particular cognitive event and to discard the large amount of background uh, spontaneous electrical activity that is coming from all the other regions of the brain uh, that, that aren't necessarily involved in that. And the idea is that we might present multiple events, so 100 button presses or 100 faces or whatever, and in effect we average out all the different electrical s signals uh, according to the onset of when the stimulus appears or when you uh, press the button. And that way um, all the spontaneous electrical activity uh, will average out to a baseline of zero and what we'll, we will be left with is the electrical activity that is specific to that particular task. When you've done this averaging, what you're left with is uh, a baseline around zero, but a series of negative and positive peaks that is distinctive depending on the particular task that's used, the particular stimulus and so on, but is characteristic of that particular cognitive operation. So again, here what we have is time along the, uh, the x-axis and the electrical activity in uh, microvolts on the y-axis. And we can see a series of positive and negative peaks that reflect the different cognitive activity or the different dipoles that are coming online. So each one of these peaks might reflect multiple dipoles, so multiple sources of electrical activity in the brain. It's not necessarily the case that only one part of the brain will be active one at a time in this kind of serial fashion. That's not really how uh, the brain works. You're always going to have more than one region active, but probably not the whole brain at one particular uh, point in time. And as we progress along the time scale, each of these components might reflect different aspects of processing. So typically the earliest components around time zero would be involved in early sensory processing of the, the stimulus. Uh, 
whereas later ones might involve, uh, for instance, in uh, higher order, so language, uh, categorization, semantic judgments, decision making, attention, uh, and, and, and so on, that happen uh, later on in this. So how can we use this particular EG or ERP uh, signature uh, to make cognitive inferences? The way that we can do this is that we can take particular cognitive stimuli and just uh, engage in various experimental manipulations. So for instance, let's take the example of face processing again. What's found is that when we present participants with faces, we see a characteristic set of negative and positive peaks. One claim that's been made is that a negative peak around 170 milliseconds, uh, also called the N170, is relatively specific to processing faces uh, relative to other objects, depending on the electrodes uh, that you measure it from. But the question is, well, what does that reveal about cognition? At the moment, not a lot. But we can do other kinds of manipulation that look at that. So, for instance, we can present familiar faces, so maybe f uh, faces of people you know versus faces of people you don't know, and see whether the amplitude or the timing of this particular ERP component changes. In this example, it doesn't. So whatever the N170 is doing, it's not processing memory representations of faces, uh, whereas later time points do. So we can see how cognition uh, unfolds over time by giving experimental manipulations and seeing which aspects of the ERP waveform are sensitive to these particular manipulations. So I've said that the N170 is relatively specific to faces. But what happens if, if we present participants with, say, two dots? Uh, well, typically you don't get uh, this particular N170 waveform. If you present the two dots, having presented two dots within the context of a smiley face, then you do start to get the N170 uh, uh, signature coming out. So it seems like the N170 is actually doing something relatively smart. It's kind of filling in a whole face, given partial information. But it only does this if you present the two dots in the context of the face. If the two dots be preserved, uh, paired with images of flowers, for instance, then you don't get this uh, perceptual reinstatement. So again, we can take this uh, N170 signature, which has no real meaning in itself, and then we can do cognitive manipulations that then give us meaning. We can start to interpret what is going on here. What we can't really interpret is where the signature is coming from in the brain. We can obviously know which electrodes it's maximal over, but it could be coming from somewhere relatively far and just conducting to those electrodes. So EEG doesn't have a particularly good spatial resolution. It has excellent temporal resolution. There are ways in which people try to estimate where in the brain these EEG sources are coming from, and to some extent this is possible, but it's not as straightforward as other methods such as fMRI. Uh, 